everybody. Welcome to this morning's PRS and PRS Global Open Tech Talk on eye tracking technology. Joining us today is Lawrence Kai. He's a second year resident from Stanford. Uh, he and uh, working with the PI, Dr. Nazarali, have co authored um, a series of articles on eye tracking technology. And today he will be presenting on assessing gaze patterns in breast reconstructive surgery. And with that, here is Dr. Kai. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the introduction. All right, thank you. So my name is Lawrence Kai. I'm a second year resident at Stanford. And today, I'm going to be talking about our work on eye tracking technology, uh, not just in breast reconstruction, but plastic surgery at large. So to begin, I have no financial disclosures, uh, but all of our equipment was on loan from Toby Pro. So to set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, we're first going to be looking at the history of eye tracking technologies, some of the early applications of eye tracking technologies in other fields. From there, moving into the use of eye tracking technology, specifically in plastic and reconstructive surgery, and then ending with the future of eye tracking and what it holds for us moving forward. So to begin, well, what is eye tracking? Uh, simply put, Eye tracking is exactly what it sounds like. It is tracking the position and the movement of one's eyes to measure what one is looking at. Um, but taking that concept a little bit further, uh, eye tracking allows us to capture a viewer's gaze and their attention by measuring how long they look at certain things and how quickly they lock onto particularly noticeable features, such as scars or deformities or even absent anatomical features. And so from this, it gives us an opportunity to better understand what features are actually responsible for drawing attention. So there are many outcomes in plastic surgery that we think are responsible for drawing attention, but oftentimes these are subjective outcomes. And so eye tracking gives us a way to objectively measure what has historically been subjective metrics. And so it's a powerful tool that's been used in a number of other fields that are, and it's just starting to come into vogue now in surgery. So some of the earliest technology was described by this gentleman named Jarvis in the 1960s. Uh, he defined the idea of an eye fixation, which is to say a locked gaze looking at something, and a saccade, which is the rapid eye movement between these points of fixations. And so in his original studies, he had a fairly medieval looking contraption in which you would wear this goggle, and then you would have suction cups placed on your eyes, and then you'd be mounted into that rig there over on the far right side and then light would be shined onto your eyes and it would track what you were looking at. And so this device had really good spatial resolution, but it couldn't actually measure anything in the time axis. And moreover, it was a little bit uncomfortable for the subject who was actually doing this experiment. But in his original work, uh, one of the studies he did was having viewers look at this painting called The Visitor, and he had them perform several different gaze tasks. So his first task was just free association, nothing specific. And here on the left is the picture, and on the right side is the actual gaze path of people as they were looking at this picture. And what you can see is that there are a few areas of high concentration, uh, particularly around the faces of people, uh, right around here. And so even without any prompting, you can see that people tend to look towards the faces of a picture. And so a little bit later on, we'll talk about what parts of the face and what features of faces capture the attention of viewers. But this starts to set the stage a little bit for the use of eye tracking in plastic and reconstructive surgery. Next, people were asked specifically to estimate the age of people in this picture. And so again, what you can see now is that there is a high concentration of time looking at the heads of these people, as this is where people tend to show their age. And then they were also asked to remember the clothes worn by the people. And again, you can see a shift in the gaze pattern now where they're looking at not only the head, but the bodies of the people and where they're wearing their clothes. And so I think what's impressive about this is that even in the 1960s, with a fairly rudimentary device, they had such good uh, spatial resolution to be able to track exactly what somebody was looking at. And more importantly, this was the first study that showed that there is a link between your eye movement and your attention. And so while it seems fairly obvious that these two things would be correlated, this is actually the first time that this was able to be demonstrated with data. So one other sidebar in this study, uh, he also had people look specifically at pictures of faces. 
And what people saw was that you spend a lot of time looking at the central triangle of the face, which is to say the eyes and the nose and a little bit of the mouth. And so without prompting, these things form the, the primary focus of one's attention looking at a face, which is again something that we'll come back to a little bit later in the talk. So moving forward from the original device, these are some of the more modern iterations of eye tracking technology. This particular method is called limbus tracking, which measures the border between the cornea and the sclera. So here there's a large color gradient that makes it quite easy to track. Um, you can also see that's a more mobile system, so rather than having these suction cups and being tied to this rig, it's something that you can wear as a set of goggles. Um, and this has uh, temporal resolution as well now, so now you can track over time the sequence of things that you're looking at. What it lacks, though, is uh, spatial resolution in the y-axis. So you can see that there's scleral show in the horizontal axis, but no scleral show in y. So you can't actually measure what somebody is looking at in a plane. Moving forward, the tech becomes a little bit more sophisticated. And now we have magnetic coils on contact lenses. And so similar to the original studies, the subject is wearing a contact lens that has a wire coil. And then a magnetic field around them allows for measurement of the deflection of their eye and measures their gaze angle as a proxy for what they're looking at. So now we have both high spatial and high temporal resolution. But again, you can imagine a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and it also requires viewers to sit within this big metal box. So this is the metal box that is, again, measuring the magnetic field of the coil. So again, not very portable. In the latest iteration of some of these eye tracking devices, which is what we've used for a lot of our studies, are infrared cameras. So here, highlighted in, in the red circle, is the camera bar and sensor. It sits uh, right in the corner of a laptop. And it projects a pattern of infrared light onto your eyes. And then cameras in that same sensor bar are measuring the reflection patterns of the light, which then allow them to see what are you actually looking at. And in these devices, you can have them set up not only as a sensor bar on a camera, but also as mobile goggles so that you can walk around and measure what you're looking at, not only on a screen, but in real 3D space. So this is, again, what we've been using for a lot of our work. <clears throat> so moving forward now, uh, eye tracking has been used fairly widely in a number of other fields, such as consumer marketing, or aviation, or even social media. So it's used very commonly in consumer marketing here uh, to understand how buyers are looking at their displays. So where an item is placed on a shelf can have a huge impact in what actually catches your attention, and then by proxy, what you end up buying. So products that are placed at your eye level are more likely to catch your attention whereas products that are placed at the lower eye levels are more likely to catch the attention of children. And so studies have shown that the longer you look at something or the more frequently you go back and look at something, uh, the more likely you are to purchase it. And so this has some pretty obvious implications for driving your behavior based on item placement alone to say nothing of the packaging or the marketing that surrounds a product, but purely based on how often you look at something will drive your behavior towards that thing. Uh, it's also been widely used in aviation, again, many of which have close parallels in surgery. So it's been used to evaluate human performance in cockpits, looking at things like your situational awareness, uh, your workload and your attention, and the difference between novice and experts, each of which you can think of has an analog in surgery. It's been used to evaluate the impact of sleep and stress and fatigue on your performance, on spatial disorientation. And it's also, it can even be used to figure out how tired a pilot is by looking at how often they blink, how they blink, and how their eye moves. It's also been used a lot in cockpit design. So in general, the way a lot of these studies work is that you mark out certain areas of interest on a field of view, either on a screen or in the real world. So here you can see they've highlighted different parts of the cockpit in green, and each of these is called an area of interest. And then as you're looking at these different things with either a camera bar or goggles, it tracks how much time you're spending looking at these different areas of interest. And from here, it allows you to figure out, well, what parts of your attention are being caught during takeoff, during landing? And from there, it allows you to possibly redesign cockpits. It allows you to think about how do you draw more attention towards parts of a cockpit that's more relevant. So obviously, aviation is a very niche field. It's not relevant to most of us. Uh, but social media is, right? Uh, social media touches everybody. And eye tracking studies in social media have looked at what parts of a profile somebody actually looks at. 
So in these pictures here, the heat maps and opacity maps are, have shown that when you look at a Facebook page, this is what you're actually seeing, that most of the page is actually blanked out to your vision, and only small sections of it are actually relevant to your attention. And so this allows developers to understand just how much of the screen is actually being looked at. It allows people to place ads in more high traffic areas or to rearrange sections to draw your attention to pictures or to comments or to news articles that a person wants to highlight. And so the big question here is, uh, so much of our behavior in everyday life is dictated by these really subtle changes in your attention queuing that many other fields have taken advantage of. So the question is, well, why isn't this used more in medicine? So this is one of the earliest studies in eye tracking in medicine, uh, looking at the use of in mammography and at radiologists. So the picture on the left shows a picture of microcalcification with a small arrow pointing to the target of interest. In the middle is an experienced radiologist looking at this picture. And so what you can see is that almost all of his or her gaze time is spent right in that area of focus. Right? They're not looking at the rest of the breast. They're not looking at the, the bright areas. They know where to look. And all of their gaze time is spent looking at that. On the right side is a, the gaze pattern for an inexperienced radiologist. And you can see that he or she spends a lot more time looking at the bright parts of the mammograph and then going back to the microcalcification and then spending a lot more time before actually coming up with a diagnosis for what they're actually looking at. So, Interestingly, as a sidebar, what the study also found was that a lot of the false negatives that come up in radiographs are not necessarily due to a missed lesion, but actually having radiologists spend a lot of time looking at a particular area and then deciding to call it as a negative. So it's a conscious and deliberate decision to evaluate something as a negative versus just a missed finding. Uh, so the question now is, why is this useful in plastic and reconstructive surgery? So, there are certain things that we believe are important in plastic and reconstructive surgery, such as the placement of scars or tension lines. And when these things aren't aligned, we believe that the eye is drawn to these features. So we have this natural inclination to hide scars and to put scars in wrinkles and to put scars in natural contours. But the question is, how important is this really? So eye tracking allows us to focus and capture a viewer's attention and to get real data, both in a preoperative, postoperative, and even intraoperative setting to better understand what somebody is looking at. And critically, what we've seen is that a viewer's attention is both a modifiable and an influenceable behavior. And so this is subtle because there are a lot of things that we don't always say out loud to our patients. Uh, describing how you're going to hide a scar will actually change how they view something. So this is an opportunity for us to improve our aesthetic outcomes. It also has the opportunity to help us inform surgical training. So particularly in the intraoperative and postoperative setting, to help guide and understand how residents are looking at a particular case. And it also gives us an opportunity to identify better techniques. So techniques that either hide scars better or help us understand some of these subjective arguments for which scar really is more aesthetic. So this is one of the first studies that was done in plastic surgery with eye tracking technology in 2009 out of Hopkins. Uh, this is a, a group that was looking at the attention to peripheral facial deformities. And what they're showing you here is 10 seconds of gaze time. So yellow is the first three seconds, green is the next three seconds, and then red is the final three seconds of the gaze time. And what you can see is that without any gross abnormalities, you spend most of your time, again, looking at the eyes and the nose, and not so much the mouth here. Uh, but again, this is the central triangle of the face, similar to what we saw in the original work from the 1960s. And so you can see that there's actually a tremendous amount of concordance between the modern infrared cameras that we use now and the same cameras that they were using 60 years ago. And so while there's no uh, temporal data with that original work, we, one might make an assumption that they had a similar sort of tracking pattern. In the next part of this study, they looked at what happens when somebody has a subtle facial deformity. So this gentleman has a small nevus on his left cheek. And again, what you see is that the view time first goes to yellow, so it goes straight to the nevus but then spends the rest of the time looking at the rest of the face and then looping back again to the central triangle of the face. And in the third part of the study, they looked at what happens with a much more prominent uh, deformity. So in this picture now, the gentleman has had the nevus removed and there's a very prominent scar. And what we see is, again, the gaze goes straight to the scar, but then again to the rest of the face and ends up in the central triangle. So 
while it may seem obvious here that deformities will draw your attention, uh, this was, again, the first time that we actually showed this with objective data. And I think more interestingly, it showed us that between looking at the central triangle of the face and looking at a deformity, this type of eye tracking study allows us to see which of these is actually more attention grabbing. So where does your eye go first? Do you look at somebody's face or do you actually straight go straight to a scar or a deformity? So this is one of the first studies with our team at Stanford. Uh, we were looking at uh, eye tracking in different stages of breast reconstruction. So we had viewers examine a series of pi uh, pictures for patients who are undergoing different stages of breast reconstruction. So here somebody is preoperative, uh, post-operative with the flap reconstruction, but before nipple reconstruction. And then in the bottom is a completed reconstruction with nipple reconstruction as well. And so we asked viewers to examine these images without a specific goal in mind and then track their gaze pattern over several seconds. And so here you can see this is one particular viewer's gaze over the first 10 or so seconds. Um, and so what you're seeing is them looking at this picture. But again, they have no specific gaze uh, task here. And so what I'd like to do is sort of play this video back for you a second time. And as you look at it, you can actually intuit what the viewer is thinking and what types of features are catching their attention. So first, they're looking at the scars around the flap, and then looking at the nipples, looking at symmetry, moving to a drain site over on the right side, and then ending up looking at the port site on the left. So again, even without any data about how they're ranking the scars or the overall aesthetic appearance, you have quite a good idea of what is capturing somebody's attention here. And so these are the heat maps of what we saw for all of our viewers in aggregate. And what we saw is that in incomplete reconstruction, so for this column in the middle, what catches your attention first is the scar, and your eye goes to that almost immediately. Uh, but then with completed reconstructions, what we saw is that two things. One, you spend more time looking at the entire picture first before your first fixation, which is to say that whatever your first point of fixation is initially, in a completed reconstruction, you have more time examining the entire patient before you lock on to that thing. And the second finding is that people spend a lot more time looking at the nipple than they do for scars in a completed reconstruction. So sort of twofold, it shows us that having a completed reconstruction not only diverts your attention away from the scar, but also helps to redistribute your gaze and evaluate the entire anatomy in a more uh, holistic fashion. This is another study looking at the use of eye tracking, uh, looking at different surgical techniques for, to repair cleft lips. So in general, uh, when there are multiple techniques to a particular problem, it often means that there's no single best agreed upon technique for a number of reasons, uh, but many of which tend to be subjective. And so eye tracking gives us a way to look at different scarring patterns to see which of these may actually draw a viewer's attention the most. So for example, in cleft lip, uh, this study looked at the Millard, the molar, and the Fisher repair, uh, each of which are preferred for different reasons. And what the study looked at is how, when viewers were looking at these pictures, how did they view the aesthetics of the scar, and then how much time did they spend looking at the picture, and how quickly did they lock on to the scars? So uh, in this particular study, they saw that on a 1 to 10 scale, the Fisher repair was rated as the most aesthetically pleasing followed by the molar repair and then ending with the Millard repair. And interestingly, they also saw that viewers spent the least amount of time looking at the Fisher repair scar and the most time looking at the rest of the face and the Fisher repair. And conversely, spent the most amount of time looking at the scars in the Millard repair. And so while this certainly isn't a claim to say that any one technique is better than all the others, it does again show that there's this strong correlation between the attractiveness rating of a scar and the amount of time that you're, you're spending actually looking at that particular scar or looking at the face as a whole. And so then there have been some other studies that look at the use of uh, eye tracking and assessing patient factors. So not just uh, the scars, but also how the role of the viewer impacts the gaze pattern. So in this particular study, uh, they looked at patients who were either surgery naive or patients who had received cosmetic plastic surgery themselves. And then they were asked to look at pictures of patients who had undergone laser resurfacing of the lip. And so here we have on the left side, uh, patients who were surgery naive and on the right side, patients who had had cosmetic surgery. And so there were three findings here that I think are particularly interesting. One is that patients who had had plastic surgery rated post-procedural images more favorably. 
they spent approximately 20% less time looking at the picture before they had their assessment of the aesthetic rating. And I think the most interesting one is that they also spent twice as much time looking at the relevant portions of the procedure. So in this case, patients who had had cosmetic surgery spent twice as much time looking at the vermilion border of the lip and the labial commissures. And so what this suggests to us is that patients who had previously had cosmetic surgery are more primed to look at the key aesthetic features of that surgery. And so it shows that our attention is not just an innate feature based on um, whatever we think looks most aesthetic, but this, that this is in fact an influenceable and it's a modifiable behavior which can work either to the benefit or to the detriment of the plastic surgeon. So in this particular case, it may be that as this patient was looking at uh, preoperative versus postoperative photos, considering whether to get surgery or in their preoperative counseling, they were told that this is the area where we're going to have the most scarring or this is the area where you're going to see the most impact that will drive somebody's attention to look at that particular feature. The last study that I want to talk a little bit about is looking at visual attention in transgender surgery. So this particular study looked at cisgendered and transgendered patients as they looked at either feminized or masculinized patients who had had top surgery. And so what they saw uh, was that patients who were cisgendered spent most of their time looking at the scarring patterns in both feminized and masculinized surgery, whereas transgendered patients spent a lot of time looking at the positioning of the nipples and checking for symmetry. And so again, what this comes back to is the idea that there are features of your eye tracking, your attention that are modifiable and influenceable, and in this case, also maybe dependent on your particular identity or things that you believe to be true about surgery. So for the last part of this talk, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, well, what do we do with this? And what does this allow us to do moving forward? Why is this important? And I think this is also the fun part because it allows us to be a little bit more speculative about the potential for eye tracking. So this is something that we've been talking quite a bit about already, which is looking at symmetry in scars and in flap design. So here, this is a common scenario of a patient who's had bilateral free flap reconstruction after mastectomy. So in comparing the scarring pattern here, uh, the question you might ask is, well, which of these is more aesthetic? And so you might reflexively answer, well, it's the one on the right, for example, because the scars there are more symmetric. But uh, how do we actually know? So things that you might consider are perhaps the sharp angled scar on the right side is actually not very aesthetic as compared to the smooth contours on the left. And what about the impact of having some hair bearing skin on the flap on the right side as well? So while we can make a lot of subjective arguments about which of these is in fact more aesthetic, uh, eye tracking can show us exactly which of these scars we look at more and which of these scars our eyes tend to slide off of a little bit easier. So eye tracking can allow us to answer questions such as which scar is more aesthetic, uh, which scar pattern is better, how should scars be hidden, and even which scar pattern does the patient think appears better. And there's even an extreme case in which you could consider resecting additional healthy mastectomy skin flap to make a more aesthetic pattern. There's also this question of subunit versus defect only repair. So going back to this point that we made um, during cleft lips, there are obviously a number of different techniques that are used to repair cleft lips. And when that happens, it means that there's not one technique that's best. Uh, similarly, in large defects of the nose like this, uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether you might want to repair just the defect or you might want to repair the entire subunit. And different people make different arguments for which technique is better, uh, but it's all, again, largely based on these subjective aesthetic outcomes that's really hard to quantify to say which of these is actually better. And so in using eye tracking, this gives us an opportunity to see perhaps in this particular defect, what type of scarring pattern might be better, what might the patient find more aesthetic at the end. And then from this, we can extrapolate to say not only for, sub, um, for defects of the nose, but of the face or even all over the body, what is the appropriate way to design a reconstruction? So in each of the examples that I've been showing so far, uh, the eye tracking technology that's been used is the camera bar that's sitting on a laptop. But there's also more powerful technology like I was showing earlier that has you put the entire rig on a pair of goggles. So this is uh, a pair of eye tracking goggles, and it doesn't look that different from a Google Glass. Or, and what it allows you to do is point of care eye tracking. So this is to say that this could be done in the clinic uh, with live patients. It could be done in the operating room. It could be done in patients postoperatively. And so this opens up the door for us to do so much more with eye tracking, not only limited to uh, a computer screen, but in the real world. 
So, for example, one potential avenue to explore is the optimization of your OR workspace. Uh, in this particular study, they were looking at cardiac perfusionists during cardiac cases and looking at what parts of the perfusionist setup is capturing their attention during a case. So what are they looking at when you're going on pump or coming off pump? And in the same way as we saw during the cockpit tracking studies, there are certain areas of interest marked out and then a gaze map marked over on the side. And so you can imagine a world in which this allows us to better optimize the workflow for a microsurgery case or to better optimize your back table when you're doing a reconstruction. You can also imagine that this could be brought to the clinic and used with patients to better understand what parts of your clinic wall are they looking at when they're trying to get information about your practice. Or as you're doing preoperative counseling for a patient, what parts of the pictures are they looking at? Or what are they really taking in as you're talking to them about the surgery that they're about to have? Um, and then this can also be used in surgical training. So there have been a number of studies that look at the use of eye tracking in general surgery, looking at laparoscopic skills. So in this particular study, they were looking at expert versus novices in a laparoscopic simulator. And what they were doing was a basic task of touching an instrument to a ball. And they saw that the main difference between novices and experts was that novices tend to spend a lot more time looking at the tip of their instrument, and they don't really move their left hand at all. And in contrast to that, experts are looking at the actual target for their laparoscopic tool, and they're moving their left hand equally. And so in a similar way, uh, eye tracking could be used to better understand, for example, what is a resident looking at during a case? Uh, it could also be used uh, on review of footage afterwards to better understand where maybe something went wrong during a case. It could be used as an objective assessment tool, such as tracking how much economy of motion one has, or even how much time one spends looking at the tip of the instrument versus the target, for example. Um, and so in the world of intraoperative teaching, there have been studies that look at superimposing an attending's gaze onto a screen while you're actually doing the surgery. So in this particular case, uh, they were doing a lap coli, and the blue is the attending's gaze during the surgery, and yellow is what the resident is looking at. And so from here, you can see that there's actually sort of a clear benefit to be able to direct somebody's attention not just with your words, but with your eyes as well. So you can imagine the situation that we often hear a lot of the times where your attending says, hey, do you see this bleeder that I'm looking at? Or do you see this perforator coming up? Or do you see this plane that I'm aiming for? And oftentimes, it's hard to actually do that with just your words. And if your hands are tied up retracting, if you can actually project your vision onto a screen, then your resident can see exactly this thing that they're talking about without the ambiguous, no, no, left, 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 almost there. And, and so I think this also can be used for residents. So you can put these goggles onto a resident and see exactly what he or she is looking at. And so that on review, you can help better guide and counsel how to do a case or what structures to stay away from. So the last thing that I want to talk about is combining this uh, with other types of technology. So one of the things that's coming into vogue right now is virtual planning. So patients can now see what a surgery would look like with certain size of implants or certain scar patterns, certain procedures and so forth on an iPad before they ever commit to surgery. And so eye tracking could be used in conjunction with these types of technologies to understand and to gauge how a patient might react to their surgery. For example, does a patient keep looking at the inframammary fold or the positioning of a nipple with a large implant? And the patient may not always be able to articulate why something looks off to them, but with eye tracking technology, you can see what a patient is looking at, and you can help better understand and better counsel them as to what sorts of um, outcomes they can expect. So to conclude, uh, three big takeaway points. One is that eye tracking has been used widely in a number of other fields. Two, it gives us this opportunity to have objective assessment of what have historically been subjective aesthetic outcomes. And three, there are extremely, there's a lot of potential uses for this in not only surgical outcomes, but intraoperative monitoring, uh, resident training, education, and beyond. Uh, but with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention this morning and open it up for any questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Aaron Kearney, I'm a resident of Northwestern. Um, very nice talk. I think it's very cool technology to see. Um, I especially like the part about um, being able to kind of see an attending's gaze during surgery. I think there's a lot of potential there for education. I personally would love to see, you know, exactly what my, you know, attending sees during sure. gaze. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned uh, there are glasses available where that can kind of track your eyes and what they're looking at. 
Um, does the technology exist <laughs> to have like a camera mounted on these glasses to kind of video record what you're seeing, or is that kind of still in progress? Yeah, so to explain, um, in this particular rig, this right here, uh, this little bar projects light. There's a camera on the backside that's actually projecting the light onto your eyes. This, I believe it's this sensor, is actually measuring the projection of that light onto the field. And then this in the center is also measuring the field itself. So when somebody is using this, somebody else can have an iPad, and it'll show both a live video of what you're looking at and in a little red circle the target of what you're looking at. And so you can imagine projecting that onto a screen at the same time to get a live view of what somebody is looking at during a case. So yeah. Very interesting. And it's great. The resolution is for when you're looking at it on a screen, the resolution is about a centimeter. Um, as you're moving about sort of in real space, the resolution is still probably, well, it depends on how far you are from the target of interest. But if you're in a case real close, you can have you know centimeter resolution as well. Where do you get the glasses, and how much do they cost? So uh, we have been working with a company called Toby. Um, so they are actually, they're around here somewhere, but we've been getting a lot of our equipment on loan from the company to do uh, a lot of these studies. Uh -huh. so, so they're not commercially available? They are commercially available. Uh, so Toby uses these cameras for all types of different fields, and they're certainly available to buy. We've, they've been kind enough to loan us their equipment for the, okay. for the interim. Thank you. Um, fortunately, I don't because they've been loaning them to us. All right. Fantastic. Lovely. Uh, let's hear it again for Dr. Kine. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.